Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Great to see all your smiling faces, and uh, just want to welcome you into this place. My name is Britton Field. I am a lead pastor at St. Paul's United Methodist Church. That music kind of gets me hyped up a little bit. It was intense. Like, let's go. Let's get this party started. So I hope you're ready for it today. Uh, I, I am I'm so glad that you're here, that you uh, made the decision to come to church today. I think our presence, like as a people, gathered together, that means something uh, in, in, in a way maybe we didn't even realize until after it was taken away, right, through the pandemic. So coming together, it does mean something. If you're a guest with us today, I want to welcome you. And if, if you're new and you haven't, we, we haven't met before, I'd love to meet you after the service. Just come say hello. I would love to just at least, at least get to know your name, maybe a little bit of your story. Uh, so come say hi. I'm happy to be here today because yesterday I was driving down the road and I've, I've I'm getting more familiar with the, the streets here in Joplin, and uh, there's, there's a lot of dips in the road in Joplin. Like, what's up with the, I've only been here for a few months, but like, what's up with all the dips? I'm trying to figure this out. And so I, was, I hit a dip, and I was not out of control. I was going a, a good speed, and my tire blew out. It ripped to shred, like all the way across, like the entire tread blew out. It was done. And I was fine. I mean, it was, there was, I was the only one in the car, totally fine. Just pulled off and fixed it. Or put, I've got a donut on there now, so we'll get it fixed eventually. But I'm glad that that happened yesterday and not today. So, like, I could just come to church and it wasn't stressful at all. I could, like, do my routine. So I'm glad to be here. It's good. It's good. <laughs> I got a text from a friend of mine. It was, it was a couple weeks ago. And the text said, hey, Britton, would you be in prayer for this important presentation that I have, uh, that I'm going to be a part of. And I said, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for that. This is a presentation that my friend was, they'd worked on a lot. They had spent uh, all kinds of energy, like they have invested into this presentation that they were going to get, give. And it, and it had all these implications, right? Like how this presentation went, it would affect this person's career. It would affect uh, the, the lives of the people that were all a part of this organization. And so it was just really, really important. And it was uh, maybe it could have been maybe a little bit divisive, and because of that, like, you know, one, imagine this in our world. One group of people think we should do one thing, and another maybe think we should do something. Okay. So there was concern about frustration and all of this stuff, and I said, yes, I will pray, and I texted my friend back and said, you've, you've got this, uh, you know, trying to be encouraging. And, and I left that for a moment, and then I, I texted back again. I said, okay, no, wait. The pastor and me just couldn't help it. I said, God's got this, and I will, I think, yeah, God does, and I will be praying for you. Basically, what I was saying is, is that whatever weight that we carry as people, like, God will, like, carry us. God can take some of that weight, and my friend actually responded back with this. She said, um, she said, thank you, Britton. All shall be well, which is kind of an odd phrase. I don't know, has anybody said all shall be well recently? Anyone? (laughs) It's a little bit old-fashioned. Well, where my friend got this from was from a 14th century mystic, and uh, the person's name is Julian, St. Julian of Norwich. Uh, she, she coined this phrase in her life, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. So she was quoting this 13th century mystic, and uh, kind of, I guess my critique of it is, yes, it's a little bit old-fashioned, but kind of cool. I've said things like this in my life many times. I've had it said to me. Uh, I will update the language a little bit. I'm sure you've done the same thing. When someone comes to you and they tell you about all the things that they have going on in their life, you're like, it will all work out in the end. Who said something like that or had it said to you? Um, sometimes we'll say, it's going to be okay. There, uh, there was a, a, a great poet and lyricist and writer, Bob Marley, and he said it like this. He said, don't worry about a thing right? Because every little thing is going to be all right. right? That, that was Bob Marley. And so we've heard this before. We've had it said to us before. But, but the difference is whenever I say it or someone says it to me, it doesn't quite have the conviction. I don't think that Julian of, Julian of Norwich had behind it. Like I've said, hey, it's going to be okay, or don't worry, you know, years down the road, this isn't going to matter. It's not going to be a big deal. I will say that, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, is it really? <laughs> is it really going to be okay? Like, I, I don't know. So I'm kind of like throwing it out there to be a positive person. That's maybe a personality flaw of mine, like overly positive, okay? 
When Julie of Norwich says, all shall be well, she means it. This is a person who lived an amazing life. Uh, she, she faced death. She, she, she was surrounded by sickness and illness and death her entire life. And so when she says, all shall be well, she means it because she entered into those dark places and came out on the other side. Uh, so we, we have been in the sermon series called Lessons from the Saints. Last week, Pastor Trey, he preached about St. Francis. If you didn't get a chance to see that, go back on our website, sp.church. Watch that sermon. It was a great sermon. And just it's, it's so interesting to hear about the life and witness of who St. Francis is. I want to spend a little bit of time today just talking about why, why would we even uh, discuss the saints? Like, why is this something that we should do? If you go to maybe another church, they, they have saints. We're, but we're Methodists. We don't have saints. And we don't saint people. Uh, so other churches, will, will, they will put th- people through this process, like this evaluation process. They'll look at their life. Um, I don't know exactly how it, it works out, but if they meet certain criteria or check certain boxes, they'll give them uh, sainthood. They'll make them a saint. They, they'll become canonized. Um, one of the, I think one of the criteria is like they would have had to perform or been a part of like two miracles, something like that. I, I, I'm not for sure. So there are churches that do that, and they give this person the status of saint. We don't really have that designation in the Methodist church, but we still believe in saints. And so to say, like, oh, saints aren't a thing, that would be, like, partly true, if if that's making sense. It would be partly true because we do believe that there are people who have gone before us who offer all kinds of knowledge and all kinds of lived experiences that we can learn from here today. And that's so important because a lot of people have, have... went through some of the most challenging circumstances that human history has ever faced. And so if we can get into their lives a little bit and see how they dealt with that, that might be helpful to us. Uh, So that's why we talk about saints. And when I say the word saint, to me that sometimes feels like unattainable or unreachable or like, do you get a picture in your head of someone that's like holier than thou, right? This, this, a person who's a saint, like, well, there's, I I could never have a conversation with that person because they're just too far out there, right? Well, A saint, though, for me, I want to define it for you. For me, a saint is a person that just opens themselves up to the grace of God. They're just saying, I'm aware of my need for grace. Because of that, I'm going to let God in. And and God just works through that person. And over the course of a lifetime, they just, you know, they just kind of become more like, like Jesus was. And so when we talk about a saint, I think all of us have the capacity to be a saint. So a saint could be you, it could be me. The goodness of God can flow through all of us. Uh, we, now there's a scripture in um, Hebrews, it's chapter 12, verse 1. It talks a little bit about saints. It says this, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those are what I would call the saints, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. So it talks about this, this cloud of witnesses, these people who have gone before them because they have done it we can too, and they're there, they're cheering us on. It kind of is referring to people like Abraham and Moses, these like biblical megastars of our faith. But, but for me, I read that scripture, and I also think about, oh, like my, my grandma. You know, I think about, like, I learned how to love probably first and foremost through my parents. They taught me what love was. My dad taught me, like, what gentleness was. My, my friends, all the relationships that we had together, we taught each other how to forgive, right? Because one friend would irritate the other, and then you got to work it out, right? So you learn for forgiveness through those people. I think that they're saints. So we, we should uh, value uh, the lives of saints. If you, if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, today the saint that we're going to talk about is Julian of Norwich. And uh, she, she is a, an incredible figure. She brought so many contributions to Christian thought and Christian theology. We, we don't even really know much about her personal life because she didn't write about it. And I think this tells us something about who she is. She, she didn't tell us about herself. She focused on, on God. That's what she wrote. And so we don't know much about her. One of the things that we do know, though, is that she uh, had these visions and these revelations from God. And so she spent a lot of her time uh, thinking about those and praying on those and reflecting on them. And those are some of the writings that we get from her. Uh, we also know that she was one of the first uh, female, uh, females to write a book in English. Think of that. 
one of the first females to write a book in English. It just really hadn't been done before. So she was like, she was breaking barriers. This is Julian of Norwich. So she was born in, Julian, uh, it, or in Norwich, England in uh, 1342. She lived till about 1416. And so she, it was about 75 years of, of life that she lived. And during her lifetime, she faced some of the most challenging, difficult circumstances. Here's a fun one. She lived through a pandemic. Think of that. She lived in England at the time of the Black Plague. And so she saw death and illness and sickness. I mean, she was surrounded by it. When she was the age of six, uh, the first wave of the Black Plague hit. And they estimate that about 30 to 60% of the people who were living in Europe died. So people were dying so fast, and you can go back in the history books, we don't even know. We, we, people were dying so fast, we couldn't even keep track of it. That was just the way it was. And of course, record keeping back then was, is a lot harder, but like, there was just so much sickness and illness. She survived that as a little child. Then wave two hit when she was, this is about 15 years later, she was 20 years old. Uh, wave two hit, and I think about 20% of the people who were living in Europe died. Just everywhere. And and. Of course, again, we don't know much about her and her story. I think about all of her friends, all of her family members that would have died through that time. In Norwich, her hometown, and this was a town that's kind of right off the the, uh, west coast of England, kind of close to mainland Europe. In that town, it was a smaller town, uh, they estimate about half the people died, which is incredible. I, I was telling people in the other service, like if you're familiar with the Marvel movies, like that's like Thanos level stuff. Half the people died. This is, uh, it's, it's wild. Uh, her, she herself, uh, that we know of, we don't, I don't think that she ever got uh, the Black Plague or the Bubonic Plague, but she, she ended up getting sick with something else when she was about 30 years old. And she had a fever, she had shortness of breath, and then uh, before long things turned critical. And she found herself on her deathbed. People thought that she, this, was, this was the end. And so while she was on her deathbed, she had these visions, 15 visions or divine revelations from God. And from that, or after those visions happened, she she thought that she was crazy. If you've ever heard from God before uh, or or felt like you've heard from God before, like do you have those friends that say, hey, like God spoke to me and God told me this. I'm like, you're crazy, man. (laughs) Right? Like it feels weird. Um, to think about. So she, she really thought that she was, she was crazy. Well, it was a few hours later, she had another, another vision. And that affirmed for her that all of these things were truly from God. So because of that experience, that near-death experience where these visions of God came to her, she dedicated her life to prayerful contemplation on those visions. So she did one of the most extreme things that you can do as an individual. She became an anchoress. And an anchoress is, is a role in the church that they, they, uh, they commit themselves to living in a room. They actually call it a cell, ironically enough. In a room or a cell for the rest of their life, and they cannot leave it. And all they do is, is basically pray and meditate on God. Uh, to, to become an anchorist in the church, though, you have to go through this religious kind of ritual, this, this act. It was called a rite of enclosure. So the bishop would come of the church and cover, would have covered Julian with dust. And the dust was to signify the death of her earthly life. And then at that moment, then she would like take this commitment and vow and she would be in this room never to leave again. Because, because or once you're in the room, if, if you would leave, you would be excommun- excommunicated from the church. So you'd be kicked out and never to come back again. So that was what she did, and that's how she spent the majority of her life. She was an anchoress. Uh, don't ask me how she would have went to the bathroom. I thought about it, and I did not have time this week to go down that rabbit hole. I'm sure there was a system. You can probably study it later and come tell me. <laughs> we'll post it on Facebook. I don't know. <laughs> I brought some pictures, actually, of, of the church that she was a part of. These are, this is the actual church. You can go and visit it today. This is St. Julian's Church in Norwich, England. You can go there. And so this is the, kind of the front of the church. Really, be, what a beautiful building. Um, this is a, a old building, again, would have been around in the 1300s. This is the back, if you walked around on the backside. There, 
is this kind of the triangular shaped room that's built off the main structure. That would have been her room. That would have been her enclosure. And then if you can walk inside and you can see some picture, uh, a picture of what it would look like on the interior as well. So it was just simple. Uh, th- that's kind of the site that you can visit today. That room, though, is not the original room. It was destroyed during World War II, which is kind of sad. Like, how cool would it to be to be, like, see the original room? It was destroyed, so they reconstructed it. it would, it's, it's the room that would have been kind of like what she was in. So that's the place where she lived, in a cell. Now, she, ha- she was not in solitude, which is a fascinating thought. She lived in this church, and she could see people come and go. She actually had a window that would view the sanctuary. So she could look out into the sanctuary when people would come for, you know, preaching or teaching or song, or they would do communion. She would be there, and she could kind of be a part of it. She could look out of the other window into, like, a a road, and there was a garden out there. People would even come up to her. This is one of the things they did with anchoresses. They, they would go and seek their help, their counsel. They would come forward and they would ask them questions and get prayer and all sorts of things. And so she would have conversations with people, but she couldn't leave a room. What a, what a fascinating life that she lived. Uh, but she, who went through all of these things, went through the black death, faced death herself, um, and then was in this room. She, out of all people, is the one who said, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. I had a hard time thinking of like, okay, if, if I look at uh, St. Julian's life, like what, what scripture might speak to her the most? Certainly you, you can't pick just one, right? Because her life is like all of our lives, like incredibly complex and we, we are about all kinds of things. But there is a particular scripture that stood out. Um, the one thing I was a little bit fearful of is like, I don't just want to pick a, pick a scripture that relates to her life and you think, like, this is all she was about. No, she was, she was about much more than that. And in fact, I don't want my message or what I'm thinking about to cover hers up. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? So, But I'm going to share with you this and then share some thoughts, and then maybe we can kind of uh, put it all together. But the scripture I want to read comes to us from the book of Hebrews, and I'm going to be in chapter 10, verse 19, through, let's see here. We're going to go through about 20, 25. And so if you have your Bibles available, uh, I I encourage you to get them out. If you don't, I think we do have some Bibles maybe floating around. If if you came to and you don't even have one, we'll get you one. So make sure when you leave, we we want you to have one. Uh, But follow along, the words will be on the screen. This is Hebrews 10. Here's what it says. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus. Uh, Real quick, I had a, a friend of mine say, like, why do we always talk about blood? Like, that's weird, and it is weird. We're going we're gonna to get there, okay. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, For he who has promised is faithful. And everyone says amen to that. And let us consider how to provoke one another and to love and do good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. A lot there. I feel like Jim Carrey after he gives gives his thing. Like, whew. What this scripture is talking about is talking about the old way of living. There's this sacrificial system in the Old Testament. What people would do is they would bring their offerings, that is an animal, to the temple. And the animal would be sacrificed, and and the priest would do that. So there's this priest that would kind of oversee the temple. People would bring their offerings. When you went into the temple, there were two rooms. One was the main room, and then there was this back room. It was behind the veil or behind the curtain. And so that's, that's what it would have been like. The priest, though, was the only one who could go back there. There's a scripture from Hebrews. It tells you a little bit about it just, just earlier. Hebrews 9, 7. Here's what it says. It says, But only the high priest goes into the second, that's the second room, and he but once a year, and not without taking the blood that he offers for himself and for the sins committed unintentionally by the people. So the priest's role would be to take the animals and and, and the blood, that's that's the weird thing about all this, take that into the back room once a year, and by offering that to God would 
would, it would be uh, forgiveness for the, the priest's sins and the people's sins, whether it was sins that they were aware of or not. And that would kind of, kind of make them, them clean. That's what, that's what they were doing. And so it required this sacrifice, this, this, this blood of, of the animals. And there was this transaction of grace that would occur, right? You bring your thing, you offer it, and then God gives you grace. That was how it worked. Well, in the scripture, what we're reading about, we see a Jesus who comes forward and offers himself uh, once and fully and finally and completely as the last sacrifice. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. And when Jesus died, it says there's this earthquake and the veil was torn. If you're familiar with that scripture, the veil was torn. What it's talking about is talking about that temple. That room that nobody could go into, that curtain was torn, it was ripped apart, so now there was no more separation between God and the people. And then when Jesus is raised from the dead through the resurrection, he now assumes this new role. It's the role of the high priest. And so we as a people, as Christians, we go through Jesus and we are offered grace. And what that means for us is that Jesus, through Jesus, the work has been done. He removed all obstacles, all roadblocks. There is no more separation. We have complete and full access to God. It is, um, it is undeniably ours. Praise be to God. And because of that, we can have assurance of our faith. We can have this assurance, this conviction, belief, this confidence that, that God will always be there with us, right? And we have access to that grace. Nothing can separate us, and so we cling to the promise, we just cling to that promise. We hold fast to the promise. And we encourage each other to do that. I love in the scripture, it talks about this. We have assurance, and, and because of that, let us consider how to provoke one another to love and to do good deeds. We here today as the church, we have a firm foundation. It's this assurance that Jesus is always with us and the work has been done so that we have grace. And so let's encourage other, other people to come along with us to do good works and to do good deeds. Not neglecting to meet together, I like that, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So coming together as a people on a regular basis, on a consistent basis to encourage one another to do, uh, to do good deeds, to share love with one another in the world, that's the message because we have assurance. And Julian had that assurance. See, she lived it. She lived the life it was surrounded by death and devastation. It was all around her. She, on her deathbed, we talked about those visions that she had. One of those visions, she saw the cross. And she said it was like glowing. And she couldn't take her eyes off, off of it. She became fixated on it. At one point, she heard this voice that was telling her to look to heaven. So move your eyes toward heaven. And she didn't do it. She said she felt like it was this temptation. She, almost like the devil was speaking to her. So she laughed. And I kind of love that imagery. She, like, or, you know, she laughed at the devil. And she stayed focused on the cross. And so in doing so, in that time and place, she started to realize that, my gosh, there, there's great power and significance in the cross. The death that I am so close to, the death that I feel like I'm experiencing right now, all of a sudden she saw the cross as like merging with her own. Does that make sense? Like It was like she could see the cross and Christ who took everything on all the way to the world, was taking her suffering on as well. And so she began to see that her suffering was not her own, but Christ was carrying her suffering. And so even in death, even in, in all kinds of loss, she saw redemption. Redemption was always possible, that the suffering wasn't the end. That's because with God, suffering always gives way to redemption. With God, suffering always gives way to redemption. And Julian of Norwich actually moves us to an interesting place because you know how we, we ask this question a lot in church or in, in Christian circles? It's a good question, but a hard one to answer. We don't have a great answer for it. It's why does God allow bad things to happen? It's, you know, why does God allow bad things to happen, especially to good people? What, what is the reason for that? And she actually doesn't even answer that question. She looks out into the world and she sees that suffering is a part of it. Remember, she lived during the Black Plague. She sees all of the stuff around her. And she's, she kind of says, that's not the right question. It's not whether or not, uh, we, you know, God is all-powerful, God is all-knowing. Will God do something? Here's what she said, or here's kind of what she's asking. She says, what do we do with it? What do we do with the suffering and the pain and the struggle that we experience? 
How do, we, how do we enter into that? Here's what she says. This is her quote. She says, and this is the knowledge of which we are most ignorant. For some of us believe that God is almighty and has power to do everything, and that he has wisdom and knows how to do everything, but that God is all love and is willing to do everything. There we stop. See, for her, it was about the love of God, Jesus, God incarnate, God in flesh, God in our world, on the cross, who was willing to go to any length, giving of himself completely and fully for you. That love that would go any distance, that would travel any lengths, that's what mattered the most. So whatever tr- uh, struggle you come here with today, whatever suffering you have, or maybe a loved one that you have, you're, you're experiencing, I want you to have that assurance like Julian had, where you, and, where you can say, all shall be well, and you know it to be true in your life. Whenever my oldest daughter, Shelby, uh, she's 10 now, she was four years old, uh, she came uh, face-to-face with death, much like Julian and Norwich did, and I didn't even really realize it at the time. Uh, my wife and I, we were out uh, traveling, uh, we, or we, were, we just had a date night, so we were kind of around the, the town, and my daughter was with my parents, and we got a phone call from them, and they said, uh, hey, Shelby's really sick, she's throwing up and she's got a fever, but we need you to talk to the nurse. And so they handed the phone over to a nurse that I was talking to, and she said, hey, your daughter, yeah, is really sick, and she's got this little bump on her finger. What it was was a hangnail, and it had gotten infected. And she said it had gotten infected so bad that we, we think we need to drain it, and then um, you should also know that there's this red streaking that's starting to move up her arm. If you know anything about that red streaking, that's a, that's a sign of infection. And so it got really serious really quickly. And so we went and got her, and we took her to the hospital, and they immediately started caring for her. Her blood pressure was incredibly low, and they uh, were doing everything, right, to try to get it back up. They were pumping her full of fluids, and her face was just puffy, and it really wasn't, it wasn't making a difference. Um, I remember being there in the hospital while they were working with her. Uh, there was a, a, a nurse and in, in our room at all times, they were checking her blood pressure every, every minute or so. And I remember being in the hospital and just begging God, like, God, save the life of my child. Please, please just save the life of my child. And through all of that, eventually she, she recovered. Uh, but she ended up, we, we figured out that she had septic shock. She went into septic shock. And uh, right outside our room was a, was a crash cart. So they were, like, ready to go to take her if they needed to, like, quickly and do whatever they needed to do to try to save her. So we, we were that close uh, to death and to, and to losing our child. And it was an, it was an interesting experience. What made it even more uh, challenging to reflect on and think about is just one week later, there was another child in that hospital that was around my daughter's age, four years old, and went into septic shock, and this child did not make it. And I think about that family. I didn't know them. I never got to meet them. I just, I just heard about it. And what does that mean for our suffering? What does that mean for our struggle? Uh, does it mean that God loved my child more than the other? Did, did I pray in a certain right way? Um, I'm sure this family was probably there begging for the, their ch- uh, child's life as well. And it just didn't, it didn't work out the same way. And so I absolutely believe that what happened to my daughter is a miracle. I, I fully believe that. But I also believe that what happened to this other child is a miracle too. Because in that death... In that pain, the promise of Jesus is that there's always resurrection and there's always, always hope. And I know that God loves that child just as much as God loves my own. And God loves those parents and that family. And so as a people of God, like what what is it that we do with that suffering? We hold fast. We hold fast to the promise and we don't waver from it. We believe that whatever challenge we face, even up to death, that God will be faithful that God is, is with us, and because of that, we can say, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. Would you pray with me? Holy God, you, you are a God who is, is good. God, we thank you for, the, for who you are, the way you reveal yourself to us, uh, for the lives of all of these uh, saints that have come before us, we thank you for Julian of Norwich, who, who lost a lot of friends and a lot of family and saw so much suffering and pain in this world. 
And she was able to say, all shall be well because she saw you. And she knew that death, death wasn't the end. And then in those really difficult moments and circumstances that, God, you enter into those places and, and you offer us redemption and hope and resurrection and new life. And so, God, as your people, we thank you for that. We want you to assure us of that type of faith. God, we bless your holy name and we ask all this in Jesus' name. And everyone here says, amen.